Thank you. Uh, okay, hopefully everyone can hear me. Um, I'm gonna. What I'm gonna do is is um, sort of talk a little bit. I'm gonna read a little bit from the book to to give you all kind of a a sense of the book as well. And um, and then yeah, I'm happy to to answer any questions. Uh, I'm gonna gonna sort of tell the story of 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 really of how the book came about and. Um, and just to, to correct one one small uh, matter is that I'm actually a writer for the New York Times Magazine, and that's relevant only because that's uh, that that was actually how this this book began. It began with a profile I wrote in 2004 of of a JAG lawyer uh, named um, Charlie Swift, Lieutenant Commander Charlie Swift, who at the time had just been assigned to represent. Uh, Osama bin Laden's uh, driver, who was in, in U.S. custody, Salam Hamdan was his name, and he had uh, essentially been been you know plucked from the JAG Corps and uh, and thrust into this position. And I went down to Washington and and wrote a wrote a profile of of this guy, Charlie Swift, and it was you know really instantly apparent to me that he was uh, you know sort of a gift from the magazine gods, you might say. He was. Um, uh, Blonde hair, blue-eyed, barrel-chested uh, guy who had um, gone to the Naval Academy and um, had really struggled at the Naval Academy, had uh, had nearly failed out, had had disciplinary problems. He actually had uh, had pretty severe ADD, and so he sort of struggled through the Naval Academy, but but made it and. Uh, Made it, um, you know, by the skin of his teeth, and uh, graduated in the bottom of his class. Um, but, but, but afterwards, um, he, after sort of a few years in the Navy, he decided to go to go back to school to go to law school. And uh, he, he really, a after getting his law degree, he, he returned to the Navy and, and joined the JAG Corps. And, and he really kind of found his calling as as a Navy lawyer, and. Um, you know, really, essentially defending defending wayward servicemen of, of things like you know drug possession and and and, um, and things like that, which were obviously a far cry from <laughs> defending uh, Osama bin Laden's driver in these uh, what would be the country's first military tribunals in in more than 50 years since World War II. So these were were really historic trials, and and um, this was a, a historic moment that that he he found himself in the center of. So um, so. So uh, basically, uh, after my story was published, I, I um, you know, I really recognized. Well, this is, you know, I'm here, here, at this sort of the beginning of of this story because he had just been assigned to defend Hamdan, and this guy really seems like a great character, and uh, and um, and this could get interesting, um, particularly because um, the expectation, of course, was, well, here's a here's a Navy lawyer, a JAG lawyer, an officer of the U.S. military, being asked to to defend this guy. By the United States government, and it's of course the United States government which is going to prosecute this guy. So, uh, of course, everyone's assumption was that that Charlie Swift would just kind of roll over and and do what the government wanted him to do, uh, and and that was not at all what Charlie Swift intended to do. Uh, not only did did Charlie plan on on actually defending this guy on the merits and and basically build a case um, arguing that he was essentially innocent, that he was more or less a, a civilian who had uh, just kind of gotten a job working for bin Laden. And um, while he had worked for him, he was not involved in any, any sorts of, uh, in any of the plots or in any way, uh, you know, a, a real sort of hardcore or, in fact, at all, a member of al-Qaeda. So not only was he planning on, on mounting that, uh, that defense, he was, he was also um, planning to go a step further and actually sue the Bush administration over the lawfulness of this trial system in which his client was was to be tried, and to do that he had uh, he had recruited um, a uh, constitutional law professor at Georgetown, uh, an Indian American man who was young in his early 30s at the time, a guy named Neil Katyal, and he had brought aboard this guy Neil Katyal. He had called him and and uh, and uh, he'd been talking to Katyal um, for for a few months about. Um, some of the constitutional issues surrounding these uh, these military tribunals, and uh, he called Katyal very eagerly after he'd been assigned to to Hamdan, and he said, uh, you know, I think I've got the client that that we can we can bring this challenge with, and and uh, and um, Katyal said, oh, you know, who is he? And he said, well, he's Bin Laden's driver. Uh, so uh, so Katyal was was a little bit uh, skittish at first, but but he signed on, and and the two of them uh, mounted this challenge together. So. 
So the book is is really essentially two stories. It's um, it's the story of of Swift and Hamdan, and um, and this kind of remarkable relationship between uh, between a, a Navy officer and an accused terrorist who's in in, in solitary confinement on Guantanamo Bay. Um, so that that's really sort of the first part of the story, and. Uh, in, in, I, I just will tell you a little bit about Hamdan, I, uh, Hamdan himself. I, as uh, journalists are not allowed to interview the detainees on Guantanamo Bay, so, so I wasn't able to actually meet him in person. I saw him in the courtroom on Guantanamo. But um, I did go to Yemen in, uh, in the summer of 2005 while I was working on the book and uh, got a chance to spend quite a bit of time with, with his family, with his wife. And he actually has two two small children, one of whom he'd never met because his wife was pregnant when he was captured. And uh, and I also got to spend some time with the man who had recruited him for for jihad. And um, and just to give you a little sense of who this guy was, he was um, born in in a region of Yemen uh, called the Hydromount, which is a, a tribal tribal really primitive tribal region in southeastern Yemen, where where in fact the Bin Laden family was from. And had uh, had been orphaned at an early age, and uh, had dropped out of school in, in roughly the equivalent of, of fourth grade. So he had about a fourth grade education. Had um, like many like many young men in Yemen, he'd kind of drifted around um, aimlessly, uneducated. The their, their, the job prospects were obviously limited for for anyone in Yemen, let alone someone with with his limited education. But uh, he he eventually kind of drifted about and made his way in his early 20s to the capital city uh, of Yemen, a, a city called Sana'a, where, uh, where he essentially spent his days uh, driving kind of part-time, driving a taxi cab, sleeping in a boarding house on a, on a sort of dirty mattress. And, uh, and then one day in, in 1996, he was, he was approached by, uh, by a, a veteran holy warrior, a, a Muslim man who had fought in Somalia and uh, Bosnia and Afghanistan, and, and this this man Nasser al Bari, whom, whom I met in Yemen, said to him, said to him, you know, come join the fight. And uh, and for a man like Hamdan, who had such such limited prospects before him, uh, it was actually um, you know a great offer. He uh, he felt um, that it was something that would give his life some purpose and meaning, and. Um, and, and frankly, also give him something, something to do, give him a job. He was going to be paid for this. So, so off they went, and they were originally planning to actually go to Tajikistan and, and fight in Tajikistan alongside the Islamic insurgency there. But they, uh, so the, this group of jihadis convened in Afghanistan and were, were on their way to Tajikistan, but they were unable to get through the border. So there they were, kind of casting around, trying to figure out what to do next, when one of the jihadis says, well, the, this, there's this Sheikh Osama bin Laden who has just set up shop in, in Afghanistan. Why don't Why don't we go see if, if he needs our help? So that's indeed what happened. And these these uh, this, this group of, of, of Muslim you know holy warriors. Uh, there were about 35 of them. Made their way to bin Laden, and bin Laden preached to them for for several days. And and about 15 of them stayed on. And Hamdan was one of those 15 men. And he worked for bin Laden as as largely as, as a driver and a, and a mechanic. For uh, for for five years, but from 1996 until uh, the aftermath of 2001, and he was picked up in the aftermath of 2001. After uh, basically he was he was still driving Bin Laden around at, after 9/11, and um, as as sort of U.S. forces and Northern Alliance forces started started sweeping across Afghanistan and making their way towards towards his home. He, uh, bin Laden and towards the al-Qaeda compound where, where all the men's families lived, bin Laden told them to go home and, and evacuate their families. Hamdan went and, and evacuated his family, brought them to the border of Pakistan, left them there, turned around to return to Afghanistan, and w was picked up and uh, by Northern Alliance forces who then turned him over to the United States. So he spent about the next six months in, in Afghanistan in, uh, in U.S. prisons before being sent to Guantanamo in, uh, in what would have been uh, May of 2002. And there he, he sat on Guantanamo for, uh, for uh, you know, quite some time before the president decided that he would be the first man tried in these military tribunals and before he was, was assigned a lawyer. Charlie Swift, who, who plays such a, a, a large role in the, in the book. And so that's a little bit about Hamdan. Now, now to return to Swift, here, here was a, a guy who was um, you know, suddenly now faced with this prospect of, of having to 
defend and build a relationship with uh, with this man who had you know worked for worked directly for Osama bin Laden, and um, you know one of my uh, my my favorite sort of stories from these 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 early months uh, in, involved um, you know his his first efforts to get down to Guantanamo because. Swift felt felt instantly like, well, of course, of course, I need to get down there, and and the government had had actually told him, in, in, had get, had sent him a letter, uh, in, the letter that appointed him to represent Hamdan, that said, you know, you may go down to Guantanamo and you may meet with your client for the purposes of negotiating a guilty plea. So, so the government's assumption was that he was going to go down there and and get this guy to plead guilty. Of course, Swift had something else in mind, as, as I mentioned earlier, uh, but the first thing he needed to do was, was get a translator. And, um, and this guy, Charlie Swift, is, 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 um, is, is sort of a nonstop talker and, um, and a real kind of uh, hard on his sleeve kind of guy and uh, just, just very passionate, uh, very zealous. And so he, he called around to try to find himself a translator and, as you can imagine, it wasn't easy to find someone who was was willing to say, um, you know, okay, I'll I'll go down to Guantanamo with you and uh, and uh, and translate for you, sit in a room in a cell with you and uh, Osama bin Laden's driver, and uh, one of the guys he called was was a professor at a at a college in a professor of geography at a college in Baltimore named Chuck Schmitz, and this guy Chuck Schmitz had gone to Berkeley and UC Santa Cruz, was very left wing and was instantly suspicious of this Navy officer calling him, telling him to go down to Guantanamo Bay with him. But, but Swift was, was nothing if not persistent and kept talking and talking and talking. And finally, this guy, Chuck Schmidt, said, okay, I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'll at least meet with you and, and we can talk about whether or, not, uh, whether or not I'll do this. So they agreed to meet one, one afternoon uh, on, a, on an outdoor metro platform between uh, Washington, D.C. and, uh, and Baltimore, where, where Chuck Schmitz lived. And, uh, and so Schmitz went to the appointed place, and, uh, and Swift was, was late, which is also sort of characteristic of Swift. And, uh, and after about a half hour, it's freezing cold, it's, it's, it's the middle of winter. After about a half hour, uh, Swift finally steps off the train, and, and Schmitz sees, sees this man in a in a, a white uh, navy uniform with a blue overcoat and a cap, and looking looking very official. And Swift gets off and shakes his hand and, and starts to uh, apologize profusely, and then launches into about a, a 20 minute uh, uh, diatribe about how how these military tribunals are unlawful and how he's going to 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 bring down this military tribunal system on behalf of this guy Salim. And so on and on he goes, and Schmitz, who's, who's standing out there in the freezing cold, finally says, finally realizes that there's no way he's going to get back on that train unless he says yes. So he finally says, uh, okay, I'll do it. And uh, at which point, uh, Lieutenant Commander Swift says, great. Now, is there any last minute advice you want to give me? And, he, and Schmitz says, well, you can start by pronouncing his name correctly. Because uh, the guy's name was actually Salim Hamdan, not Salim Hamdan. So, so that was sort of how how Swift kind of entered into this, um, all, all full of uh, full of passion and vigor, but uh, but but still uh, far from sort of grasping all, all the details like his client's name. Um, so, so uh, what I'd like to do now is is sort of read uh, read to you from from the uh, from what would be his first his first. Um, Meeting with Hamdan, which happened shortly after this this meeting with his translator on the subway platform, and um, you know just to, to set the scene um, a little more more fully, I mean, the situation now from from Hamdan's perspective is is um, you know here he's been in U.S. custody now for for two years, he's been interrogated dozens of times by by men in, in military uniforms, and now into his cell. Uh, is going to walk this this man, Lieutenant Commander Charlie Swift, who's who's going to tell him that I, I, I'm actually here to help you, and um, you know what are the odds that uh, that this guy Hamdan is going to believe him? So um, I'm going to just read from this passage and then uh, and then move on from there. Guantanamo Bay Naval Base is divided into two areas, windward and leeward, by the two and a half mile wide bay for which it is named. The airport is on the leeward side. Nearly everything else is a short, far, sh short ferry ride away on the windward side. There are housing subdivisions, a few fast food restaurants, a strip mall, a bowling alley, a drive-in movie theater, and a neglected nine-hole golf course. The overall effect is small-town America, if a sad and somewhat dated version of it. 
The whole base is about 45 square miles, or roughly the size of the island of Manhattan. After disembarking from the ferry, Swift and Schmitz made their way to the headquarters of the joint task force that runs the base. They happened to arrive in the midst of a drill to prepare for a terrorist attack. Roadblocks had been erected everywhere, and the female soldier charged with preparing their access badges was made up to look like a casualty. Theatrics that were hardly necessary to make this place one of the strangest either of them had ever been. Swift soon found his footing, though. Asked to sign a statement ensuring that he wouldn't say anything to the media about what they saw in Guantanamo, he insisted on amending the language to read that he wouldn't say anything in violation of the National Security Act. That evening, he and Schmitz went to the Marine Galley, which Swift had heard, which Swift had been told had decent food and a great view. It was surf and turf night, so they ate steak and lobster, followed by Ben and Jerry's peace pops as they watched the sun drop down below the bay. Thirty-six hours later, they set out for Camp Delta in a rusty red van to meet Hamdan. From a distance, Swift could make out the plywood guard towers draped in American flags, and as they drew closer, the heavy chain-link fencing topped with concertina wire that ringed the camp. A four-by-eight-foot sign hung from the main entrance to Delta, honor bound to defend freedom, the motto for the Joint Task Force Guantanamo. Swift wore a khaki uniform rather than his dress whites because he wanted to seem as accessible as possible. At the entrance gate, he declined to place a strip of black tape over his name tag, the custom among most soldiers and officers who prefer to keep their identities hidden from the suspected terrorists inside. For the past several weeks, ever since the president had designated him for trial by military commission, Hamdan had been in solitary confinement, or as the Defense Department called it, pre-trial confinement, in a separate area inside Camp Delta known as Camp Echo. The administration didn't want the other detainees to know that he had been assigned a lawyer, or worse, give him the chance to report to the rest of the prison population on the substance of their conversations. Swift and Schmitz were led down a long dirt path toward a cluster of eight cinder block huts with corrugated tin roofs that faced inward on a square. It hadn't rained on Guantanamo in weeks, and they kicked up small clouds of dust as they walked. The guards unlocked the door to Echo 3, and Swift got his first look at Hamdan, a small, frail-looking man, five feet six inches, 130 pounds, he estimated, in a baggy orange jumpsuit. He had a shaved head and a long beard, and he was smiling. As Swift would later learn, Hamdan always smiled when he was nervous. The hut was divided in two by a heavy metal grate. On one side was a metal bed and stainless steel toilet. On the other were two abutting folding tables and three white plastic chairs. Solemn Hamdan sat at the opposite end of the tables beneath a bank of bright fluorescent lights. His hands and feet were bound to a chain around his waist, his ankles fastened to an eye bolt in the floor. An old air conditioning unit labored noisily against the stifling heat. I want him released from those chains, Swift said. We can't do that, one of the guards answered. After some debate, they agreed at least to unchain his hands. They asked Swift if he wanted one of them to remain in the cell, and Swift said no. They showed him the red panic button marked duress on the wall and left him alone with his client. I'm a military attorney and I've been appointed to represent you, Swift began. I can understand if you don't trust me right now. I work for the same people who are holding you here. He proceeded to, de de to detail his educational background in military rank, which an Arab culture expert had told Swift would impress Hamdan. They didn't seem to. Hamdan was polite but curt, insisting on a civilian lawyer. He wasn't any happier with Schmitz. He wanted an Arab translator. Swift asked for a chance to earn his trust. Whether Hamdan really believed that Swift was his lawyer, or more likely, just another interrogator, he was eager to rant about his mistreatment at the hands of the Americans. He told Swift that during his first several weeks in Bagram, he had been stashed away in a dark cell in the basement of the prison when representatives from the International Committee of the Red Cross came through. Swift scribbled furiously onto a yellow pad as Hamdan spoke. About an hour into their two-and-a-half-hour meeting, Swift told Hamdan about the government's offer, 20 years for a guilty plea and full cooperation. What do they say I've done, Hamdan asked. They haven't charged you yet, Swift answered. They sent me here to negotiate a guilty plea. How can I plead guilty if I don't know what I've done, Hamdan asked. After a long pause, Hamdan asked Swift if he thought he should take the deal. Swift gave him his advice. These military commissions are presidential policy, 
And sooner or later, the president is going to change. A different president may want to pursue a different foreign policy. If you plead guilty to something, no president is going to argue for your release. On the other hand, if you plead not guilty, there's a very real possibility that someone in the future may release you. Swift then outlined for Hamdan the alternative to a guilty plea. He listed some of the rights under the Geneva Conventions and the Uniform Code of Military Justice that he believed Hamdan was entitled to, but had thus far been denied. It was unclear how much, if anything, Hamdan was grasping, yet Swift pressed on. The only way to get you these rights is to sue the Bush administration, he said. That's what I'd like to do, sue President Bush. Another long pause followed. This lawsuit, will it make you rich, Hamdan finally asked. No, Swift answered, but it might make me famous. Then he added, it might make you famous too. I don't want to be famous, Hamdan replied. I just want to get out of here. That night, Swift and Schmitz watched the, arms, watched the Super Bowl on Armed Forces television, and the following day they returned to Camp Echo. At the end of the meeting, Swift told Hamdan they'd be back soon and encouraged him to think about the government's offer in the interim. Do you believe we're here to help you, Swift asked, standing up to leave? A drowning man will grab onto any hand that's extended to him, Hamdan replied. So that was the beginning of, of what was to become really an extraordinary relationship between, between Swift and Hamdan. And, um, and, you know, when I say extraordinary, what I mean is that, um, you know, Swift essentially had to keep Hamdan alive. And, and you know, I, I don't think I'm really, I, I'm not being hyperbolic when I say that. I mean, here was a man, Hamdan, who went on numerous hunger strikes on Guantanamo Bay. Uh, at, at one point actually had to be uh, force-fed in a restraining chair. And, um, and so, you know, on, on top of that, he also uh, fired Swift uh, on numerous occasions and, um, and lashed out at him really pretty much every time they met because Swift was really the only person that, uh, that Hamdan was in regular contact with. So, you know, if he was unhappy with his treatment and, and really uh, as much as anything, he was, uh, uh, he, was, he was concerned most of all about his day-to-day -day treatment. I mean, how much time he got to spend outside exercising, whether he got to, to keep nuts in his cell, um, whether he, he whether he actually got to speak to other detainees, whether he was out, going to be outside solitary confinement, and um, and when when his when he wasn't happy with his conditions, which you can imagine was was pretty much all the time, uh, he took it out on on Swift, and and um, and you know on, on top of that, you you have a situation where where Swift found himself kind of continually having to having to earn this guy's trust and earn it back because you know even after they'd been together for months. Hamdan still wasn't quite sure if this guy really was his lawyer and really was was looking out for his best interests, or if he was actually just just another representative of the government who was you know out to out to put him away. Um, so it was 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 you know, an enormous challenge for Swift, and and they developed really really a uh, an intense relationship. Um, and um, so so uh, that's sort of the the story of Swift and Hamdan, which which I, I tell throughout throughout the story. This this kind of remarkable relationship. Um, and the other story that, that kind of, uh, uh, you know, sort of that threads through the book is, is the legal story. And that is, is largely the story of, of Swift's partner, uh, the, uh, the, law, the Georgetown law professor whom I mentioned earlier, Neil Katyal, who, uh, who, who basically was the architect of this lawsuit that they, bought, that they brought against the Bush administration. And um, what this lawsuit uh, argued in essence was was that these military tribunals were, were illegal for for a number of reasons and um, you know sort of first and foremost they were illegal because the president had unilaterally uh, created them in in the aftermath of, of 9/11 in November of 2001 without going to Congress first and without including Congress in the process so so you had a, a what was essentially a violation of, of the separation of powers you had the president usurping Congress Congress's role as as the the, the body that, that writes the laws, uh, and the, in this case, the president had had basically assigned a, a group of civilian lawyers in the Pentagon, working under under the Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld, to to draw up the rules for these trials and to, to write up what the charges would be after these men were already in custody uh, and then to, to carry out the trials so uh, without any congressional involvement. So, so that was, was one of the central, uh, central tenets of, of, of the lawsuit. And the others were that um, 
that, that the trial itself, the trial system itself, lacked protections, due process protections, that were guaranteed by the Geneva Conventions and by the Uniform Code of Military Justice, which is the law that, that governs um, the military law, essentially. So, so they brought this lawsuit back in, uh, back in, in 2004. And at the time, the Bush administration was arguing, and, and the, the federal courts had, had um, largely bought into this, almost, almost entirely bought into this, that, that, that this lawsuit couldn't even be heard by the federal courts because, because Guantanamo Bay was outside the jurisdiction of the federal court system. So, so their first obstacle was, could they even get a judge to, to hear their case? And um, what happened, and um, you know, I know uh, a lot of you probably have heard the names of some of these cases over the past few years, Hamdan, Hamdi, um, Rasul, Boumedien, uh, all, Padilla, all these cases that have, I think for many people, kind of, uh, kind of just uh, formed uh, kind of a little bit of a, a you know, Arabic alphabet soup here. Uh, and it's hard to keep them all straight, but and I'm going to try to try to, to to sort of tease some of them out for you here. That that the the the, the first decision and the fir the first significant decision was the decision that that opened the federal courts to the detainees on Guantanamo Bay, and that was that was the Rasul decision, and that happened in 2004. And once that decision came down, they 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 knew that at least they were going to get a shot. They were at least going to get a hearing uh, in in federal court that, that Hamdan was going to have a chance to contest these trials. And so, so that's indeed what happened. And the, the, essentially what they were trying to do here was stop this military trial from happening uh, before, it, b before it actually happened and convicted Hamdan. So it was really almost a race between their lawsuit and the military tribunal itself. And they got into federal court. They made their argument and uh, were awaiting a decision when the tribunal got underway. And uh, I was down there uh, back in, it was in uh, November of 2004 on Guantanamo when this, this military, when, when it was one of the, the pretrial hearings started. And uh, there was a small, small group of us in, in the audience, uh, myself and a few other reporters and a few um, human rights observers. And, and the, the hearings got underway and had been, uh, Swift got up to make his first argument and uh, spoke for about, about 40 minutes and sat back down and, uh, and then um, all of a sudden uh, uh, an MP walks into the courtroom with a, a yellow post-it note and hands it to, to the judge, the military judge, and the military judge bangs his gavel and, and gets up and everyone's kind of scratching their head and, and wondering what's going on. And about 20 minutes later he walks back in and uh, announces that, that uh, that the tribunal's been in indefinitely adjourned, and, and, and the reason why is because the federal judge in Washington, who had heard, heard their case just two weeks earlier, had declared, that, that had declared these trials unlawful and had uh, ordered that they be stopped. So as you can imagine, it was an incredibly dramatic moment here on Guantanamo Bay, particularly because there was a tropical rainstorm happening outside as well. Uh, and um, you know, it was a, it was a, a federal judge you know, the district court, I mean, the lowest, uh, the lowest uh, level of federal court st stopping this trial uh, in, you know, in midstream or before it had even gotten underway. So they, they won that, that, that phase. The government, of course, um, appealed immediately. And uh, at the Court of Appeals, they lost. So needless to say, the next, the next step was to petition the Supreme Court to, to consider their case. And uh, this this happened in uh, in, in summer of, of 2005, and uh, they they wrote up their uh, their petition and and to give you some sense of of how long the odds were against them actually getting a hearing at the Supreme Court, just just uh, if you consider the the simple numbers, uh, the Supreme Court receives about 8,000 petitions every year and it hears about 100 cases, so the odds just on their face were incredibly long, but. But in their case, it seemed that, that the odds were, were, were even longer because one thing that the court really, really doesn't like to do is, is rule, take a case that might force them to basically rule against the president and the, against the president's um, 
efforts or, or what, what he claims are his efforts to keep the country safe during a time of war. And, you know, that's certainly an understandable instinct on the part of the court. Um, you know, who are they? These are, these are unelected, uh, unelected um, judges appointed for life, accountable to no one, uh, not military experts by and large. Whereas the president, the commander in chief of the United States, has access to, to the, the greatest military advisors in the country, so surely he, he knows uh, how to keep the country. He knows more about keeping the country safe than, than these justices do. So, so you have this this kind of inherent wariness on the part of the court to to rule uh, to, to come out and rule against the president. On the other hand, if they rule with the president. You have uh, you you get uh, they run to, into problems as they did when they uh, validated the uh, the Japanese uh, internment camps during World War II, where you have uh, a, a law a, a decision issued by the Supreme Court which is has a kind of permanence that a that a mere presidential uh, executive order doesn't necessarily have. I mean this could be the, the the law of the land for generations to come. So if they find themselves endorsing some sort of draconian action on the part of the administration, uh, it could create even uh, uh, an even bigger problem. So, so what, what, so what does the court do typically in this situation? They opt not to hear the case at all. Uh, as as uh, Justice Brandeis once said, the most important thing we do is not doing. Uh, and so, so in, in their case, it, it really uh, it, it seemed as though um, though you know, the odds were, were indeed very long. Uh, they filed their petition and they waited uh, weeks uh, and then weeks became months and they still hadn't heard back from the court. The court kept passing week in and week out. The justices meet, meet every week to discuss the new petitions and, and it was always on the schedule. They were, they were presumably talking about it but they made no decision for weeks and then months on end uh, until one day uh, Neil Katyal, the, the Georgetown law professor who had done um, you know, basically monitored this this Supreme Court blog, SCOTUS blog, it's called. Uh, monitored it, you know, every every morning at, at the con after after the Supreme Court's conference, he was there at his computer, refreshing refreshing his uh, his web the the web page, you know, repeatedly waiting to to get word. And and one morning, months after they'd filed their petition, he he the, the headline on uh, on SCOTUS blog read the court to hear military tribunal case. Uh, so the court took the case, and at that point. The question, uh, of course, became, well, who was going to argue this this um, historic case? And um, Neil Katyal, who, uh, whom I haven't told you much about, but just to, to fill in some of his background, he was he was a young man. He was in, in his uh, mid 30s at that point. A few years had passed. He was was really a brilliant young scholar of constitutional law. He'd been at the top of his class at Yale Law School. He'd clerked on the Supreme Court himself for Justice Breyer. He had served in the uh, Clinton administration Justice Department when he was in his 20s as as a lawyer in the Justice Department. So he was certainly a guy who was going places. Who was very very bright and very capable, but he had really zero courtroom experience. He had argued um, three cases in his life, one of which was a traffic ticket, um, another one of which was, was a landlord-tenant dispute in law school as part of a, a legal clinic. So uh, here was a guy who, who really um, had, had, uh, had, had spent no time in, inside uh, courtrooms, and, um, and here was a case that, uh, that was going to clearly make history. And uh, really, all of the people around him who were uh, who had been advising him, and and all the people wh whom he trusted, said to him, "You can't argue this case. You have to give this case to a more experienced Supreme Court advocate." And Neil Katyal really wrestled with the decision, uh, but he ultimately decided that that he was going to argue it. And so, what he did uh, in order to kind of justify this decision was that he decided he was going to prepare so obsessively for this argument that uh, there would be no question that if nothing else he was certainly prepared for it. And what that entail entailed was really, really nothing short of extraordinary. It was what, what he, he, the first thing he did was he took out a legal pad and he wrote down uh, all of the names of, of every lawyer and law professor in the country who most intimidated him. And this is a guy who is not easily intimidated. This is just really a, a brilliant young mind. And he, he wrote down, he wrote up this list and he invited all of them to participate in moot courts where they would, they would moot him, they would basically um, grill him uh, all across the country. So he did, uh, he did 15 of these moot courts in five different cities 
and you know, just to give you a sense of how unusual that is, most Supreme Court advocates do one, maybe two, and they f the, the general conventional wisdom is that you know, if you do more than two, you're, you're, you're doing yourself a potential disservice because uh, your answers are going to start to sound tired. There's, there's, uh, there's, there's a degree of spontaneity. You can't anticipate all the justices' questions anyway, and um, you're just going to basically wear yourself out. But, but Neil felt that um, you know he was going to uh, going to err in the other direction. Clearly, so uh, so he he did these 15 moots. He also had uh, had his research assistant keep track of every single question he was answered, and every single question he uh, every single uh, question he was asked, and every single answer he gave on a spreadsheet that you know eventually numbered hundreds of pages. And he would study that spreadsheet and look at his answers and hone his answers. All of, all of the moots were also being tape recorded. He would listen to them over and over again to sort of get a sense of how he had done, what he had done wrong. He listened uh, in, you, you can download from the internet Supreme Court arguments, pa past Supreme Court arguments. So he, he did that every, every time he was at the gym or in his car, every, every moment when he couldn't be studying, uh, he would be listening to uh, what one of uh, what what he felt was a, was a was a good or even great Supreme Court argument to get a sense of of the sort of rhythm of the argument and how a great argument felt and what the great advocates did to to make their argument successful, and and uh, he he also kept uh, a copy of the entire trial record, numbering hundreds and hundreds of pages. Every transcript, every every document that had been filed, every brief that had been filed in the case, kept by his bed at night, and he would study it every night before he went to bed. And his goal, which which he achieved, was to be able to, when asked, if asked, in in the courtroom, by one of the justices, oh, Mr. Katyal, where can we find that in uh, in in uh, the trial record? You know, in that situation. Needless to say, most advocates start flipping through their pages and, and find the citation for the justice. Uh, Neil wanted to be able to just off the top of his head say, oh, uh, Justice Kennedy, that's, uh, that's page 64, paragraph 2. And he actually had that opportunity. Uh, in, in Justice Stevens did ask him exactly that sort of question, and he, he without hesitation, directed Justice Stevens to exactly the, the right page and the right place on that page. And uh, the other thing he did, um, and, and here is a very, very serious scholar of constitutional law, uh, but, but he, he recognized that um, you know, perhaps the biggest obstacle for him was that you know, he wasn't comfortable standing up in front of, uh, in front of a room full of people and, and just kind of you know, being himself and having a conversation with the justices, which is, is in a sense what, what arguing at the Supreme Court is all about. So, so he he uh, was was uh, persuaded to um, to to work with a, a touchy feely uh, trial consultant, who is uh, um, you know the, the kind of guy who uh, you know uses the sorts of methods hand holding etc that uh, that he is you know would find anathema but but he was willing to do it, and um, you know among other things this this trial consultant had him line up his children's one one of his uh, child's uh, stuffed animals. Uh, in a row, and pretend that they were the Supreme Court justices, and make eye contact with them, so he could practice making eye contact. And another thing that that uh, this trial consultant had him do that he did was uh, was um, he insisted that on the morning of the argument, that he get up, uh, that the first thing he do when when he get up and, and when he got up and, and took a shower was to sing in the shower. Because and and not just you know hum and not just sing softly, but to really sing, because that way when he got into the courtroom and started to deliver his argument, his the sound of his own voice wouldn't sound unfamiliar or funny to him. It would seem perfectly natural. So, uh, so with that, I'm gonna I'm gonna now read another another um, passage to you that that will take us to the moment when um, when he is actually. Uh, um, driving to the courtroom on the day of the argument, um, after his his months of preparation, after um, after really uh, a lot of second thoughts about um, maybe I should have uh, maybe I should have given this argument up, um, but here he is on on the morning of the argument, on his way to the court courthouse, um, about to about to to deliver his his argument in front of the justices. March twenty eight. 
2006 dawned clear and brisk in Washington. Katyal awoke early, having slept better than he expected. He felt less anxious than he'd felt in a while. In six hours, win or lose, it would all be over. He put on a dark gray suit and a Gucci tie that his mother had given him for the occasion and stashed his father's wristwatch in his pocket for good luck. Katyal had received some threatening voicemail messages over the past few weeks and had hired two bodyguards for the day. They picked him up a little after eight and drove him to the Supreme Court in his minivan while he listened to music on his iPod. The Supreme Court's tradition of humility and restraint appears to have been the last thing on the mind of the courthouse's architects. An early occupant, Justice Harlan Fisk Stone, once described the Supreme Court building as almost bombastically pretentious. One of Stone's colleagues suggested that the only way he and his brethren could live up to the pomp of their surroundings would be to enter the courthouse on elephants. As one of the day's advocates, Katyal had been asked to enter through a side door, but he wanted to use the main entrance instead. Somewhat counterintuitively, he felt that absorbing, absorbing the full grandiosity of the setting, the long marble staircase, the 16 Corinthian columns, the words equal justice under law etched into the stone below the pediment, would have a calming effect, putting things in perspective for him. Whatever the stakes of Hamdan, he was still just one lawyer arguing one case in the long history of this great institution. By the time Katyal arrived, the plaza facing the courthouse was flooded with people, dozens of whom had spent the whole night in line waiting for tickets. Electronic devices are not permitted inside the Supreme Court, so he left his iPod and Blackberry inside the marshal's office. It was 8.45 a.m., roughly two hours before Hamdan, the second argument of the day, would be heard. The interior of the Supreme Court building, with its soaring ceilings, ornate friezes, bronze busts, and still more marble, marble columns, is no less imposing than the building's exterior. But Katyal felt at home there. He still knew some of the security guards, and behind the counter in the cafeteria was a woman who had often made him breakfast during his clerkship. She gave him a hug and wished him luck. Arguing advocates may request a card that entitles them to roam certain parts of the Supreme Court building not open to the public. Goldstein, that's Tom Goldstein, who was one of his advisors on the case, had suggested to Katyal that he procure one and hole up in the law library to relax and gather his thoughts before the argument. Katyal had planned to do this, but was overtaken by an irrational fear that he might get stuck in the library, which was upstairs, and miss his argument. So when he finished eating his bagel, he instead did the one thing that Goldstein had urged him not to do. He went into the courtroom and listened to the argument preceding Hamdan. The lawyer at the podium, who looked to be even younger than Katyal, parried complicated questions from the, branch, from the bench with ease and grace, thrusting Katyal into a fresh spiral of self-doubt. Why didn't I give the argument away? I can't answer any of these questions. Then it dawned on him that he wouldn't have to. This wasn't Hamdan. It was a health insurance case that turned on an especially obscure subsection of the Employee Retirement Income Security Act of 1974. Katyal left the courtroom at 10.35, 25 minutes before his argument was to begin. He had not sung in the shower in the morning because he hadn't wanted to wake up Joanna, his wife, who was going to be coming to the courthouse later with his mother and sister. So he went into a stall in the bathroom of the lawyer's lounge and built it out the theme song from Mr.'s Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. <laughs> Katyal returned to the courtroom. Chief Justice Roberts closed the prior argument, the case is submitted, rose from his black leather chair and walked off the bench, leaving the ensuing proceedings in the hands of the court's senior most justice, John Paul Stevens. We'll hear argument in 05184, Hamdan against Rumsfeld, Justice Stevens, justice Stevens said at 1101. Mr. Katyal, you may proceed. The lawyer who had preceded Katyal was still clearing his papers as Katyal moved to the podium. He brought with him a white binder with one sheet of paper attached to the front and another attached to the back. One sheet contained his opening statement, the other a page of typewritten notes. Taped to the side of the page of notes was a blank check, a reminder to use the resonant phrase that Justice O'Connor had penned in an opinion in 2004, a state of war is not a blank check for the president. All 500 of the courtroom seats were occupied. 
Moments before the argument started, Swift overheard a brief exchange directly behind him between an unlikely pair, the Pentagon's advisor for the military commissions, General Hemingway, and a human rights lawyer who was working with some of the Guantanamo detainees. They agreed that Katyal was in for a long morning. Katyal was now at the podium. Standing before the justices, he was struck by the intimacy of the setting. He took a moment to compose himself, to think about his family, and make eye contact with each of the justices, and began. Justice Stevens, and may it please the court. So from here, uh, I, I obviously uh, launch into uh, a discussion of, of the, the narrative of, of the argument itself. And, um, and uh, a couple of months later, um, after the argument, which, which you know, Katyal, by, by, by sort of unanimous agreement, had performed very well, uh, though he was going up against um, the man who is, is probably the greatest, uh, greatest living Supreme Court advocate, uh, a guy named Paul Clement, who's the Solicitor General. Uh, he, after the argument, uh, a couple of months passed, and, and, um, and it became time to start uh, wondering when the decision was going to come down. And the Supreme Court hands down its decisions. It, it never, never announces uh, its decisions. They're always handed down in the courtroom at the moment, uh, at the moment that they're, they're um, completed and issued. There's never any kind of advance notice about, uh, about what's, what, what decision's going to be coming down next and, and what, certainly not, what they're going to say. So, so, you know, if you want to be the, the first one to hear, <laughs> to hear the decision in, in a case you've argued, there's only one way to do it, and that's, that's to go to the courtroom. But, of course, the added complication is you don't know which day it's coming, and, and the court has heard dozens of, of cases, and you don't know which day the, uh, the opinion in your case is coming down. So what Katyal had to do, basically, was at a certain point, after a, a, a reasonable period of time had elapsed, uh, he started going to the court every morning on decision day. And he and, and Swift would, would meet there outside the courtroom, and they would walk in together, and they would take a seat, and the justices would file in, and Katyal would study their faces and try to figure out if, if you know, maybe he could read into their faces that uh, Hamdan was coming that day. And day, uh, day after day, decision day after day passed without any decision on Hamdan. So finally, the, uh, it was the second to last day of the term, and there was a rumor going around that that was the day that the Hamdan decision was going to be uh, handed down. And uh, the courtroom was, was unusually full that day. Uh, and Katyal went, went to the courtroom as he had on so many other days. And, uh, and again, the decision didn't come down. But at that point, there were only two cases left. So Chief Justice Roberts said, um, tomorrow at uh, 10 a.m., we'll, uh, we'll hand down these, these final two decisions. And uh, the next morning, once again, Katyal, for the umpteenth time, uh, met Swift outside, filed into the courtroom, and the justices uh, made their way uh, uh, down the uh, down the hall and took their seats along the bench. And um, Katyal had worked uh, as a law student for for uh, Chief Justice Roberts, uh, not as a law student, as a, as a as a recent graduate. He had worked for Chief Justice Roberts, and they had been um, you know somewhat friendly since then. And uh, Chief Justice Roberts had not heard their case. He had recused himself because he had been on the Court of Appeals when the Court of Appeals heard their case. So Katyal saw Justice, uh, Ro Chief Justice Roberts walking, walking in, and he looked at him, and he, he saw what he thought was a grin, and a subtle grin, and he slipped a note to Swift that said, I think we've won. And they had won. And the decision was was um, you know much much more uh, more than than he had ever imagined. It was a, a sweeping decision. Uh, many people consider it to be the most important decision on presidential power ever, because not only did the Supreme Court declare that these trials were were indeed unlawful, that the president, if the president wants to use these trials to prosecute uh, enemy combatants, he needs to do so through Congress. Congress needs to write the rules. Uh, and and not not only that, but these rules have to comport with the Geneva Conventions, and they have to comport with the Uniform Code of Military Justice. Not only not only had the court said that, the court had basically said that that in, in saying that, the court was 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 stating very clearly that the president has to comply with the law. You have to give these guys rights that they're entitled to under under the law, the Uniform Code of Military Justice, and under 
our treaties, the Geneva Conventions. So the court was saying that the president has to obey the law even during wartime. And this actually had um, kind of amazingly a significant impact on, on the Bush administration's policies in the war on terror because you had programs like, uh, like the, the rendition program to, to where we had ghost prisons in, in foreign countries where, where detainees were, were taken and interrogated um, outside, very much outside the, the purview of, of the United States and, and interrogated and, and um, you know, tortured by, uh, by, um, by foreign military members. And um, th this program was now illegal because it was it violated U.S. law and the, pre and the Supreme Court had said very clearly that, uh, that the president couldn't, couldn't, couldn't do that. So uh, it was a, a, a sweeping decision. And what happened next was essentially the, 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 the president turned around and said to Congress that, um, you know, I, 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 I want you to authorize these trials. And um, Congress, over the course of the summer of 2006, had a very heated debate about uh, whether or not uh, they would and, and what exactly uh, the, new, uh, the new rules for the trials would be. And, and in fact, um, one of our presidential candidates, John McCain, was, 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 uh, was uh, probably the central figure in, in, in the Senate in, in, in these negotiations because he felt very strongly that um, one of the things that the Bush administration wanted to do was, was basically to, to – suspend our obligations to, to the Geneva Conventions and, and John McCain and, and many members of our U.S. military felt very strongly that, that we couldn't do that, that um, that's, not, that's not what we did and that, that it would put our own, our own troops at risk if we were to, to, to basically sanction the violation of the Geneva Conventions. So uh, this debate played out and um, new trial rules were drawn up, which many still believe are, are – uh, <laughs> are uh, unlawful and, and unfair, but nevertheless, they were certainly fairer. And Hamdan, after, after all of these years, was, was finally brought to trial just, just a few months ago. And he was uh, brought to, he, he had to be recharged now because his old charges were, were, had been thrown out. Uh, and he was recharged with, uh, with conspiracy and with material support for terrorism. And he was acquitted on the conspiracy charge, which was the more serious charge. He was convicted on the material support charge, the lesser charge. And then it came time for this panel of military officers to, to render, uh, to, to, to give him a sentence. And they, the, the, he, he was, he, he could have been sentenced uh, up to life. I mean, he was, he was um, eligible for a life sentence. The, the uh, government was pushing for 30 years. And uh, the, the panel of military officers who were, who were asked to, to, to devise his sentence gave him the equivalent of, of a little bit under f five months. Uh, so this happened um, just, just in August. And the question now is um, what will happen in five months? What will happen in, in December when, uh, when that period of time has elapsed? Will the administration really let him go? Or will they hold him as an enemy combatant because the administration has um, – has uh, sort of asserted the right to keep these guys even after trial uh, if they're believed to be a threat until the end of hostilities. Now, how do we define the end of hostilities in the war on terror? Well, it's, it's kind of impossible to do so. I mean, the, the hostilities could, could very well go on um, well beyond my lifetime, and, and how will we ever know when they're over? When will this war end? So, so it's, it's a sort of <laughs> a dubious proposition. Um, but uh, nevertheless, that, that's where things stand. And, um, and you know, just one, one final thing I'd, I'd like to say before I um, open it up to questions is, um, you know, there have been a number of, of books written um, uh, about the Bush administration and the, the, the behavior of the Bush administration and some of these, um, I think, what we can all, all fairly call sort of excesses of, of, uh, of presidential power. Um, and, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a widespread, I think, sense, I don't know, I'm maybe overstating it, but I think a lot of people feel uh, have done a lot of, of hand wringing, and you know I think some of it is is, is understandable that um, uh, about the sort of state of affairs and about the fact that you know we've we've done all these um, you know violated violated the Geneva Conventions that we've tortured people that we've irreparably um, damaged uh, damaged our reputation abroad and um, you know and, and all of this is legitimate, but. Um, but the thing that, that really has stuck with me, having, having written this book, having spent um, years, um, four years, with, with these two men um, and with all of the, 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 the people around them, the military officers, the military lawyers, um, and um, 
and uh, the lawyers who are working pro bono on this case for you know basic law firms that have spent millions of dollars helping them, um, was to me, uh, it, it felt to me like um, more than anything, this, this great sort of triumph of, of our nation's values and indeed of, of our, our constitutional system of government that you had, you know, in what other country could an accused terrorist represented by an officer of the military during wartime bring a case against the commander in chief, take it all the way to the highest court in the land, get a hearing, win, not be killed, <laughs> And, uh, and and cha really change the course of history. So um, so to me, it was just this this just such a, a validation of of the resilience of of our, our system of government, the resilience of our constitution, and of the greatness of, of these in individuals who are you know both both um, you know filled with flaws as, as you will find if you read the book. They they um, I, I I really um, you know certainly don't. Um, don't hide any of their uh, any of their failings um, sort of, or, or the mistakes they made along the way, um, but nevertheless they they uh, they they fought on this guy's behalf and they they were fighting not not because uh, not for uh, on a matter of guilt or innocence necessarily, but because because they believed that he was was being denied a fair trial and that he should have the right to to defend himself as as anyone should, guilty or not. Uh, and that to, to fail to do so would reflect, um, you know, very poorly on our country. And so, you know, so to me, this is is ultimately a really kind of an uplifting story of of uh, of really the triumph of American values and of of the resilience of of, of our system. And um, and you know, just to just to take it um, even one step further, Swift, Lieutenant Commander Swift, uh, in in shortly after their argument at the Supreme Court. He was up for promotion in the military, and he was denied his promotion. And in the military, if you're denied your promotion, it was, you get two shots, and this was his second shot. And uh, it's, it's up or out, basically. So it was expected that he would leave, and he did leave. And this was in, in the summer of 2006. And, uh, and um, this happened, happened to also coincide with his wife leaving him. And, um, you know, it was obviously a, just a very difficult time for him. Here's a man who had spent his entire uh, entire adult life, I mean, beginning with the day he, he went off to the military academy at, at age 18, uh, off to the naval academy at age 18, uh, he, he was now, uh, you know, cut, cut off from the military. He was, you know, being sort of cast out into the, into the world and, and without his, his, his wife, whom he'd been with, uh, who had been his, his sweetheart at the Naval Academy, whom he'd married months after his graduation uh, from the Naval Academy at the chapel, uh, inside the chapel underneath the cross, the cross swords of the, uh, the Annapolis Chapel. All this fell apart for him, and, uh, and he was back out in the civilian world. And he actually spent a year teaching right here at, at Emory, uh, and is uh, has now left there and is, is living in Seattle. But but just a few weeks ago, when this trial got underway on Guantanamo Bay, there Swift was by his side in civilian clothes, having paid his own way down there to Guantanamo Bay to represent this guy. And to me, that was just you know about the strongest statement you could make about this country's values. So uh, so um, that's uh, that's that's where I'll end and. Um, and I'm happy to, to take any questions and uh, hear any comments. Thank you. Yeah, it's a very good question, and um, and the, there's a there's a somewhat complicated, but not not too complicated answer. Uh, first of all, the decision was was initially made by the the chief prosecutor for the the military tribunals, a guy named Scott Lang, um, who is uh, no longer in the military, but he. Uh, it was his job. Basically, he he and the other prosecutors arrived in the Pentagon and were presented with with um, the files of of some of these guys um, who are who are now in U.S. custody. And when I say the files, I mean the you know the, their their interrogations, the the summaries of their interrogations, et cetera. And it was his job, basically, him him and the other the, the small handful of guys who were there in that in those early days, to decide who who whom they would try first. And when he came across Hamdan. He liked the case for, for a number of reasons. And um, one is that he felt that he was able to, to, to really trace a 
the chain of custody. He, he, he knew where Hamdan had been every step of the way. There wasn't, uh, he hadn't been rendered to a foreign country, really, most significantly, which, which would raise this whole sort of specter of, of doubt about his treatment. And he felt, frankly, like it was a, a relatively clean case that he hadn't been tortured. Uh, now, as it turned out, when, when Hamdan did come to trial in August, on the very first day of the proceedings, the military judge threw out a number of his confessions because he had determined that they had, in fact, been, been coerced. But relative to some of the others, um, this, this prosecutor, Scott Lang, felt that, that he looked okay. Uh, and so that was one reason. Another significant reason was that Hamdan had cooperated. He had talked to interrogators. He had told them who he was. He had uh, he had given uh, given given the, given all the information that you know. He, he basically sealed his own fate. He had confessed to being Bin Laden's driver. It was it was going to be an easy case to win. Uh, and one final reason is that um, you know in the event that he didn't plead guilty, which no one was uh, no one was counting on, but in the event that he didn't plead guilty, here was a guy who had worked for Bin Laden from 1996. To, to 2001. So from a kind of narrative perspective, from a storytelling perspective, it would be an opportunity for the government to, to really tell the whole story of al-Qaeda's jihad against America. They could do things as they did in, in his trial, uh, like, like showing, um, they, they brought down a, a, a guy who showed a film of, uh, that was basically just a film of al-Qaeda's jihad against America that had lots of, of footage from, from various terrorist attacks. Uh, this actually, uh, just as a side note, backfired against the government because when Hamdan was confronted with these images in the courtroom, he started weeping. <laughs> well, um, and that was something that the government hadn't anticipated that he would have a, this sort of natural reaction to recoil from, from seeing this. And, um, you know, I think that probably had some, some effect. Now, in terms of your question, why, why this guy? Because certainly you would expect, you know, here we are, launching these historic military tribunals, something this country hasn't done in, in more than 50 years, uh, you would think after this, this, you know, obviously this horrendous terrorist attack, the worst attack on, on U.S. soil in this nation's history, you would think that, that the first guy we would want to put in the dock would be, uh, would be a big guy, you know, uh, you know a leader. Exactly. KSM would have been just fine. Any any kind of big uh, any sort of big fish, not a not a lowly uh, driver and mechanic. Uh, but actually, one of the things that the, that the government um, wanted to, to to do was um, to ensure was was a conviction, and they wanted to to uh, if if things went wrong, they didn't want to to have kind of blown it with because it's a brand new trial system. They didn't want to have blown it with a guy like uh, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed or, or someone like that, they wanted to, you know, look, if, if it turned out that a lot of the uh, evidence uh, was inadmissible uh, and their case kind of fell apart in the courtroom, you know, it would be one thing for the case to fall apart with a guy like, um, you know, Salam Hamdan, who was a, a driver. It would be another thing for the case to fall apart if it was a, a, a big guy like, like KSM. So, so sort of somewhat counterintuitively, they, they kind of deliberately chose uh, a smaller fish. Yes? Sure. Yes. Right. That's right. Um, no, well, it doesn't because, um, well, for a variety of reasons. I mean, one is is the 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 well, just on on the most basic level, uh, I think it's very unlikely that the government will will choose to hold him after five months because, uh, you know, at that point, if he, they've put so much energy into making these these um, tribunals happen, that uh, that the, you know they're clearly invested in, in wanting them to work, and if you if you you know turn around and, and sort of ignore the sentence uh, rendered by by this this panel of military officers, then you're really saying there's there's no point in having these trials. I mean, they're just they're purely show trials. If you're not even going to listen to to what the jury uh, the jury's verdict. So so on that level, I think I think it's unlikely they'll hold him. But but you know even if they do. Um, you know, as I said earlier, the, the Supreme Court decision was, was about much more than, than these military tribunals. The Supreme Court decision was, was about 
the President's obligation to honor the laws and treaties of the United States. And in fact, you know, within, within days of the decision uh, being handed down, the President was shutting down the, the rendition program, for instance. So, so things happen that, that, um, you know, that were sort of beyond the, the purview of these, these military tribunals. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, they they claim that it's it's um, it's basically during a time of war. Once someone has been designated an enemy combatant and and therefore you know potential threat to to the nation, uh, once once he's been declared an enemy combatant during a time of war, he can be held until the end of hostilities as as a you know basically as a prisoner of war. Um, so which you know has always been. The policy, you know, you, 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 you hold prisoners until the war is over and then you send them back. But here we have a war unlike any other war that's, that's likely to go on and on and on and on. So, um, you know, we obviously need some, some different rules. But that's, that is the basis for it. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh-huh. Yeah, well, <laughs> it does seem sort of uh, evident on its face. Um, you know, the uh, the argument that's made on the other side, um, which is the argument that that lost, that they defeated, was that um, treaties don't confer individual rights, don't confer rights on individuals. That, in other words, that you know, an individual can't walk into a courtroom in the United States and say, "My rights under this international treaty have been violated." That that. It's only, it only that, that, that a treaty can only confer rights on an individual once it's been enshrined in, in law in the United States. That treaties are matters for states to work out. So, in other words, you know, if a Yemeni man's uh, rights under the Geneva Conventions have been violated, he can't walk into a courtroom. But if the government of Ye Yemen wants to say to the United States, "Hey, you can't do that," you know. We're both well. Yemen's not a signatory to the Geneva Conventions, but, but we're both signatories to the Geneva Conventions, and and you can't do that. That's that's how treaties are supposed to work. Um, I mean, this is I'm, I'm giving you the other argument. Uh, it's the argument that lost and that I don't agree with. But that was that was what the administration was saying that um, that 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 essentially international treaties don't confer individual rights. Yeah. So, for example, uh -huh. yep, yep. Hmm. I don't know. I'm at. You're out of my pay grade there. <laughs> I'm not a lawyer. I'm not sure how that would work. It's a good question. <laughs> yes. Uh huh. Well, that that it was five. The five months was after time served. That that was I I, I should have made that clear. Uh, it was, um, th it was um, you know however many years, but the jury had given him that sentence. Had asked before before they 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 issued that sentence. They asked the judge to be very clear. They actually had him you know draw some diagrams, very clear about how much credit he would be given for time served. So they knew exactly what they were doing. So so it was it was several. It was a number of years. But after time served, it's it's was four months and twenty two days. Uh, yeah, in the beginning, I mean, he he was, um, you know, he was was sort of thwarted at every turn because what what happened was initially was that. Um, he and uh, and these other lawyers had been uh, just a, a few of them really had been uh, had been appointed to this office before they were given clients, and uh, and so here they were for months. Actually, he spent about nine months without a client, 
and you know what was he doing that during that time but but studying up on uh, on international law and, and war crimes and the various supreme relevant supreme court precedents and taking a very close hard look at these military tribunals and and coming to the conclusion that they were unlawful and getting ready to make a challenge and um, and the defense department at the time was you know was was well aware that uh, what they were doing uh, what he and his colleagues were doing because they, they didn't have anything else to do. And uh, and so at that point, the Defense Department tried to, to give them things to do. Um, they tried to, to get them to, to actually help um, help tweak some of the rules of the commissions to, to make them a little more airtight. And uh, and Swift and his colleagues refused to do that. They said, you know, we're not we're not going to build a better mouse tra mouse trap for our clients. Uh, you know what? What we're here to do is actually the opposite. We're here to exploit holes in the system. So, uh, so, so things like that, um, like that happened. But um, you know, one one thing I, I would note that I think is is sort of interesting because um, uh, you know, for for everything that that Swift did, um, you know, certainly the government was never expecting him to to do really any of this. I mean, what they were expecting was for him to to plead guilty. And short of that, they were expecting him to, you know, if he was gonna gonna try to, to you know, plead not guilty, he'll he would make his fight within the system. They certainly didn't expect him to challenge the system. But the truth is that that it wasn't even really that. I don't think that and this becomes a matter of opinion. But but my view, it wasn't even really that that did him in in the military. What it was that that did him in and that that prevented him from getting promoted uh, above all was the fact that. You know, inside the military, there's uh, there's uh, you know a code that in 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 the JAG Corps that you, know, you don't take your cases public. You you know you you fight for your guys, but it's the military. It's you know we're, we're going to do it inside the the in, inside these walls. And um, Swift knew that there was no way that he could really mount much of a defense for for Hamdan if he didn't get out there and talk to the media. And you know, tell as many people uh, as would listen to him that we can't do this, that we can't try people this way, that we're going to be setting a terrible precedent. And he knew basically that he had to kind of get the, he had to change, you know, change public opinion. So, uh, so he went to the media, he testified uh, in the Senate, and uh, you know, he 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 really kind of made himself into a public public critic of the government, and that I think is is what really kind of sealed his fate that he had. Uh, uh, you know that he had, um, you know, violated that that kind of unwritten rule. Yes. Uh huh. Uh huh. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, well, I think uh, that's it's a good question. I'd say a couple of things. One is that um, uh, it, you know, as lenient as it was, you have to keep in mind that you know he he time served was significant. I mean, this guy had been in U.S. custody since uh, since November of two thousand and one, and had been kept in, in solitary confinement for much of this time, um, and you know was really losing his mind. Had, as I said, had gone on hunger strikes. I mean, had you know, virtually tried to kill himself. So I mean, I think you know there was that. Um, uh, but the other thing, and, and this gets into to, um, uh, issues that, that are uh, national, national security issues and, and evidence that, that I uh, was not allowed to see. But he was, Hamdan was, was very, very cooperative with, the, with his interrogators. And, um, you know, I know uh, uh, what some of the things he did included taking, taking um, U.S. officers around Afghanistan um, to where bin Laden had been after 9/11, uh, and he had clearly provided them with a lot of, of actionable intelligence. And um, and you know, there's there's more. There are more specifics that are that that I haven't been been that I'm not privy to, but that the the the, the panel of of officers on his jury were privy to. And and uh, I would say that that above all, um, I, I mean, I think you've asked a very perceptive question because I think. Had had I think he gave the United States information that 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 I don't know that was very very important and useful, and I think that um, 
that that probably was the single biggest factor. Unfortunately, you know, we may never know what that information was, and, and nor is it in Hamdan's interest, obviously, to, 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 for anyone to know, because he's got to go back to Yemen someday. <laughs> yeah, yes? He hasn't at this point. He, I think he's starting his own firm now, actually. So he's, um, he's, uh, you know, he's just uh, kind of uh, going to start up his own, his own shop. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. What was Swift's role? Yeah. Well, I mean, his role throughout was was to manage Hamdan uh, and to spend. I mean, he he he. He literally visited Hamdan every month for for several days, and um, and that was more than just just you know seeing Hamdan and and you know sort of trying to keep him seen. It was also fighting on Guantanamo constantly for uh, for for Hamdan to be uh, uh, you know for, for 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 him to be given another hour of exercise every week, and uh, uh, and so so he was doing that, and um, he was also uh, you know. He was very much the public face of the case, so he was the one who was always speaking to the media, and that was a deliberate decision that that here was a man in a military uniform was going to have a lot more moral authority than than a than frankly a, an Indian American a law professor. So uh, so so he was he was certainly busy doing that and um, you know talking to talking to the media and, and testifying here and there and speaking here and there. Uh, and you know he was involved to some extent with uh, with the um, the legal work, the briefing, but 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 not much. I mean that wasn't really his thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You're only given a lawyer, uh, assigned a navy lawyer or a military lawyer, I should say, when you're designated for for one of these military tribunals. So the vast majority of the detainees on Guantanamo Bay are n are not going to be tried in this system. Um, we don't know what's going to happen to them, but they're not going to be tried in the system. And you're only given a lawyer once once you are designated for trial. Uh, they do have lawyers. Uh, I mean, all all who want a lawyer now have a lawyer. It's it's you know typically um, you know an organization um, you know like the Center for Constitutional Rights or 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 in many cases large uh, large corporate law firms. I mean you know firms like Paul Weiss, some of the most respected firms in in, in the country, have have pro bono uh, lawyers working down there. So. One more. The next case, uh, well, there, there, there are two in the in the pipeline. One is a one is a, a guy named um, Omar Cotter, who's a very young man. Um, was uh, was 15 at the time of his capture. Uh, is 20 now, so he's due to be tried next. And uh, he uh, he actually is is in one of the photographs of of, um, of Hamdan. Uh, that, that the government had in, in evidence um, where he's with bin Laden. This, this boy Omar Cotter's there and he's uh, eight years old. And uh, so he's next and, um, and then after him will, will likely be Khalid Sheikh Mohammed who will be the first, the first you know, big dog, I guess. Um, you know, the question is, is going to be whether, uh, whether they're going to have enough admissible evidence to, to try someone like him who's you know, certainly, certainly been, been tortured. So. Thank you.